It is my pleasure to introduce to you today our guest speaker. It is uh, Imam Jamal Rahman, and he is a, uh, originally from Bang Bangladesh. He has an abiding faith in the power of heart-to-heart -heart connections to encompass differences and dissolve prejudices. You are gonna love him because he's a popular speaker on Islam, Sufi spirituality, and interfaith re relations. He is a part of the Interfaith Amigos. He's been featured in the New York Times, CBS News, the BBC, and various NPR programs. Jamal is co-founder of the Muslim Sufi Minister, uh, and a Muslim Sufi minister at the Interfaith Community Sanctuary, and he's also an adjunct fac faculty at Seattle University. He has written a ton of books. Uh, the first one I have listed here is The Sacred Laughter of the Sufis, just to kind of give you a little taste. You can look him up and check out his books, and one thing that you may not know is that he is going to be coming here and uh, to, the, to teach the wisdom of the world religions. Um, it is gonna be on Zoom. The, the Quran and the Hadith, we're doing a dive into sacred texts this year. So uh, if you wanna join him, you can, you can sign up for that on May 27th and do, June 24th, The Wisdom of the World Religions. And I know you're gonna want to because uh, he is quite amazing. He has got a huge heart, He's a man of a lot of love, and you will be hearing that right now. Take it away, Jamal. My friends, the topic is love in the Islamic tradition. And Islamic sages say that love is the cause and essence of everything. But they also tell us, like Rumi said, when I came to love, I was ashamed of everything or anything I ever said about love. Because what we think love is, is actually degrees of domination and servitude. But that's not love. Love, says Rumi, is something which comes complete, like the moon uh, in the sky. Like an ocean whose depths we cannot fathom. The garden of love is eternally green that fears neither uh, fall nor winter and yields fruits more than just joy and sorrow. The sages also say you can't use reason, rationality to comprehend the mystery of love. Cautious men of intellect, they shrink from a dead end. Lovers, completely carefree, they trample on dragons. There's a true story of a student who came for being inducted into Sufism to his teacher. But the only question the teacher asked was, have you ever been in love? And the student was so surprised. Uh, and he said, no. And the teacher said, if you have not been ensnared or caught by love, you're like a bird without wings. Go, uh, fall in love and come back. And the student did, and he became a great teacher. <laughs> but he had to experience, to taste the, the, the vibration of love, to begin to understand what love is. Uh, I love the poetry of, of a Hafiz, who says that whenever you meet somebody, you're always saying, Please love me, please love me, please love me. And of course, you're saying this silently. Otherwise, Hafiz says, somebody would call the cops. <laughs> but the great mystery is that God, spirit, divinity, also yearns, longs to be loved. There's a beautiful saying, or God says to the Prophet Muhammad in a dream, to each one of us, to, oh, 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 you beloved one, God says, I was a secret treasure, and I longed to be known, and so I created you, and, and the worlds, visible and invisible. Rumi says, it is God who suffers his absence in me, who through me cries out to herself. 
love's most strange, holy mystery. We are intimate beyond belief. And of course, this yearning to love God is cosmically encoded inside every single human being. The Quran says, before God sent humanity to earth, God gathered all of the unborn souls and said, am I not your sustainer? And we were so excited, so enthused. We, we cried out, yes, yes, we testify it. But of course, when you come to earth, we forget. And that's okay. For doom to forget, so we might remember. For doom to slumber, so we might awaken. But there comes a time in our lives, we want to become a seeker. We want to get out of this hypnotic trance of life and we yearn to become a better human being. We want our life to have purpose, to have meaning. We set our foot on the path of love, which is a path of mystery. And so Islamic sages say that the several steps on this journey the first one is we yearn to transform our ego, go beyond our ego, so that we can connect with the divine spark which exists within every single human being. Two stories, uh, Rumi stories, to, to begin to understand the meaning of the I, I, me, me, which stands between me and divinity. A lover pining for the beloved finally has a chance to meet the beloved and the lover takes out the letters and reads those love letters he had written to her. And the beloved says, here we are, finally together and all you do is read your love letters? You insist on expressing emotions that represent you, not me. It is you who is the object of your affection, your love, your quest, not me. For you, I am the dwelling place of the beloved, not the beloved. True love, says Rumi, is fixed on the gold, not the coffer. Another story, a lover searching for the beloved finally finds the dwelling place of the beloved and excitedly, enthusiastically uh, knocks on the door. And uh, the beloved says, who is it? And the lover says, it is I, I, me, me. And the beloved says, go away, there's no place for you. And the lover is so shocked, stunned, disappointed, bewildered. But travels the world, and this fire of separation burns the dross of the ego, and finally the lover realizes and comes back, and once again knocks on the door, and the beloved says, Who is it? And the lover says, It is you, it is you. And the beloved says, Oh, come on in, come on in, there's space enough for both of us. Just be with that story to go beyond the ego. How else can we experience love for God? And what that really means, the Quran says, is we yearn for a, a nearness, a closeness, a proximity to the glow of presence. The Quran says, bring a sound heart to God, a beautiful heart to God. And sages explain, they say, what can you offer God? Everything you have belongs to God. Anything you take is like taking gold to a gold mine, a ruby to a ruby mine, spices to the Orient. But, but what you can really take is a heart that is polished. The Quran says on the heart is the rust of your negative thoughts your negative behavior, 
cleanse your heart, polish your heart. So when you bring it to God, it reflects the face of Allah in that polished mirror. That's the best gift. One more gift the Quran says you can take to God is righteous deeds, acts of service. The Quran says, and the exact quotation is, God endows with love those who engage in righteous deeds. And I love this insight by sages that, Jamal, no matter how much money you accumulate, how many titles you attain, on the day of your death, you will have to leave it behind at your palace. And it's beautiful that, uh, Jamal, you have a wonderful community, loving family and friends, but they can accompany you only up to the gravesite. But what takes you beyond the gravesite, what propels you forward, is the record of your good deeds. So just be with that. Going beyond the ego, purifying the heart, accumulating good deeds on this journey of getting closer to God. In the Quran, the most used word is Allah, God of all of humanity. The second most used word is ilm, meaning knowledge. And the Islamic sages explain that there is knowledge of the tongue and knowledge of the heart. We need book learning to make, your, make our way in the world. But if our heart is not pure, if our ego is not transformed, we might lapse into what the sages call scholarly vertigo or an exhausted famousness. But if we cleanse our heart, or another metaphor, open up our heart, Rumi says you begin to hear bird song in the egg. That's authentic love of knowledge. And there's a lot of depth to it. The Quran says we have placed in the human being, the names of all things. What does that mean? We don't quite know, but uh, Islamic teachers say that, have you noticed that birds, they know how to make nests. Bees know how to, how to collect nectar. Beavers know how to make dams. They, they didn't go to graduate school, university. How do they have this knowledge? It's a knowledge of the heart. Just speak with it for a few seconds. Do I understand moving from a knowledge of the tongue to a knowledge of the heart? Loving your knowledge in the depths of your heart. I love this story of this very famous scholarly sheikh who with his followers, they go around the country to really help people understand the meaning of the Quran. and sharing with them the, 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 the proper way to do the Islamic rituals. And they've heard of this uh, imam in a remote, faraway place. So he and his followers, they cross the river on the motor launch and they suffer this inconvenience and visit this illiterate imam who loves the Quran. But and he's saying the words in a very incorrect way, doing the Islamic rituals also uh, totally wrong. And the sheikh and his followers are so happy. They've come here just in the nick of time to save this imam and his followers from going astray. So they spent one week, two weeks, four painstaking king weeks to share how to say the words correctly, do the prayers in an Islamic way. And when they return, on the motor launch on the river, they're so happy that they have saved this imam from leading his congregation astray. And suddenly, the sheikh hears the voice of the imam and he's looking around, where is the voice coming from? And the, the voice says, 
Sheikh, Sheikh, oh, famous scholar, I, I've forgotten those words, please repeat it to me again. And he sees that this illiterate imam is running on the water besides the motor launch. And this humbles the famous scholarly Sheikh and he says, no, no, what you're doing is perfectly fine. Just continue with your ways. The illiterate imam has knowledge of the heart. Just be with that for a few moments. Okay, now, very important. Every tradition has it, love of the other. Uh, the neighbor, uh, the stranger. And somebody you don't like. Very critical to repeat what uh, I love to say all the time that how can you love somebody who might be adversarial? And the Islamic sages, they tell us again and again, please know that you are disliking that person's behavior, but that person's being is sacred. It is sacrosanct. It is Christ nature, Buddha nature, Elohim nature, Allah nature, Krishna nature. For example, a wonderful uh, mystic Kabir says, in somebody who is the other outside your tribe, you don't like. Again, make a distinction between behavior and being. Protect yourself. Don't allow yourself to be abused. Take the right action. But as you take the right action, I beg you, I implore you, says Kabir, please do not leave this person's being out of your heart. And just this differentiation between behavior and being has the power to shift heaven and earth. This is a critical teaching about loving the other, especially someone you don't like. The Quran talks about loving a committed relationship. Husband, wife, your partner. And the Quran says, God has created spouses from among you so that you might dwell in tranquility with them. And God has put love and mercy in your hearts. The Prophet Muhammad said, marriage is half of religion. The Quran asks us to really honor our parents. But the Quran is very forthright. It says that if your parents, they mislead you, cause you to go astray, you have a right to disobey them. But nonetheless, please take care of your parents in their old age. The words of the Quran is, spread upon them humbly the wings of your tenderness and pray to God, oh God, please grace my parents with your blessings because they cherished me and they nurtured me when I was a child. And especially the Quran lays a lot of emphasis on loving and revering your mother. There's several verses where the Quran says, revere God. And immediately the second verse following that is, and also revere the wombs that bore you. Prophet Muhammad said, paradise lies, paradise lies at the feet of your mothers. I'd like to add one more uh, love which sages emphasize. Loving your teacher, especially those days when students were apprenticed for a long time with a very loving, devoted teacher. I love the story where one particular student, in fact, lives with the teacher, prays with the teacher, learns from the teacher. And there's a prayer in the Islamic tradition early in the morning, pre-dawn. And this uh, young student would get up an hour or two before the dawn prayers and 
collect the firewood and light the fire to warm up water because before Muslims pray, they do ablution. They cleanse themselves. But one day, one morning, the student woke up late, just a few minutes before prayer. And he filled up the cold water in that wintry uh, environment. And he felt so sad that he couldn't serve his, his teacher. So he put the pot of water next to his heart and said, Oh, heart, I'm so sorry that I couldn't warm up this water. And then he gave the pot to his teacher. And the teacher, as he poured the water on his hands and feet, he said, oh my God, the, did you, you, you overheated the water this time. Well, how did you do it? <laughs> this is the power of the love of the heart of the student for the teacher. Okay, the Quran also says, love animals. And the verses are, animals are communities just like your own. And they all have a way of prayer and praise of the sustainer that is very unique to them. For me, and this is, I, I struggle with this, I, for me a spiritual practice is to visit, whenever I can, slaughterhouses. To raise my consciousness. To make me go beyond my addiction to my taste for meat. And I'm so happy that uh, now there's plant-based meat and now meat can be cultured in the laboratories where they can harvest the cells from the muscles, say, of the cows and create actual meat without slaughtering the animal. Anyhow, um, if I'm eating meat, you eat meat, let us truly, humbly, sincerely, and fully thank the animals for sacrificing their, lo their lives for our addiction to meat. And if possible, slowly eat less and less meat. Love of nature. The Quran has 750 verses uh, on nature on nature and the Quran says among the signs of God is nature meaning nature is very holy and Sufi sages say that actually the holiest of manuscripts is nature and Prophet Muhammad famously said the earth is like your mother protect her honor her So it is critical for me, for you, to uh, reduce our carbon footprint, to really become aware of and support all those wonderful activists who educate us and they are working on issues of loss of biodiversity, climate change, uh, ecosystem collapse. If I love nature, I have to take action and support those activists. I also love to connect my heart with nature by meditating on the imagery of nature. So for example, about love, I love the words of Hafiz. The earth would die if the sun stopped kissing her. But even after all this time, the sun never tells the earth, hey, you owe me. And look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the entire sky. It's about unconditional love. I love the other one by Rumi. Grass agrees to die and rise up again so you can receive a little of the animal's enthusiasm. Unconditional love. Okay, two more points. Loving life fully. The Quran says, enjoy the good things of life. Enjoy the good things of life. Simply do not transgress the bounds of what is right. That's subjective. But may I live fully, taste life. Hafiz says, you know, Jamal, the greatest regret 
on your deathbed might, might be that you might say, Oh, universe, I did not kiss you enough. So sages say, participate in the bazaar of life. If you make mistakes, you can learn from that and grow from that. Take some risks. Uh, it reminds me of a story. A, teacher went, a student went to his teacher and said, Oh, teacher, I'm so glad you have taught me so many beautiful things because now when I have to make an important decision, I think not once, not twice, but three times before I plunge in. And the master said, once is enough. One more point about life. Teacher said, please laugh. Laugh a lot. You have no idea who you are, where you came from, where you're going. Laugh. And Hafiz says, what is laughter? It is a sound of a soul waking up. Okay, lastly, most critical. May I love myself? If I cannot love myself, I can never truly, authentically, genuinely love the other. If I cannot be compassionate, gentle, merciful with myself, I can never be gentle, compassionate, merciful with you. And again, uh, have compassion of yourself because as I said earlier, you have no idea who you are, where you came from, where you're going. Secondly, the great sages say, you know, we have to do this work of transforming the ego from a commanding master into a personal assistant. You can use willpower, it's important, but then the ego uses imagination to counter and overpower the willpower. You can use reason, that's powerful, but the ego comes up with even more beguiling reason to counteract that. But if you use love, mercy, gentleness, the ego relents and begins to become transformed. To be, to be gentle, to be loving, to be compassionate with your ego does not mean that you avoid or deny what needs to be done. It just means the work which is essential, critical, do it, but with the energy of gentleness. I love the words of that uh, wonderful poet Tagore who says, if I remember, not hammer strokes, not hammer strokes, but the gentle dance of the water sings the pebbles into perfection. The third point about compassion is to love yourself, please, in any way you can, through any spiritual practice, honor, heal your difficult feelings like anger, hate, resentment, jealousy, sadness, depression. These are simply energies begging your attention. All energy, all feelings that the Quran says are sacred. So in Sufism, there's a wonderful practice called sacred holding where you allow yourself to experience your difficult feeling and bring it into you and just be present with it. Like Carl Jung says, Will you have the courage and the grace to kiss the demons and dragons within you? That is how they turn into a prince or princess. So please acknowledge, honor, heal, love and kiss your difficult feelings. Your anger becomes transformed into greater enthusiasm, fear into mindfulness. Uh, Rumi says, this work is difficult. Loving yourself by honoring your feelings. But he says, this is how it is. Take a pickaxe and break open your stony heart. The heart's matrix is glutted with rubies. Springs of laughter are buried in your chest. So my dear friends, I'll end with just two quotations. 
One is by Rumi who says, love is in every religion, but love has no religion. And the last one, which I always repeat is, Jamal, when you came here from the invisible world, everybody around you was laughing and smiling, but you were crying and weeping. Live such a life. Live such a life that when you depart, everybody around you is crying and weeping, but you're laughing and smiling. This is the essential journey of love on planet Earth. Thank you. Watch the sun fall out of sight And with my heart undone Came tears I cried with all my mind I sit and watch the sky And every star seems so high Then I wonder why Someday we all must say goodbye. How many times have you let yourself feel the fire? Standing so close to the heat of love's desire. When it ends alone, you seek to find your peaceful path. God is creator of love and light. Its wisdom speaks to me. Let go the past, be in the here and now. can walk along and walk a peaceful path how many times you let yourself get inspired how many times do you follow your heart desire When you walk this road, you know you've walked a peaceful path. You can walk alone and still walk a peaceful path. Out on my own tonight, this time it feels so right. God shining light, so bright it fills the sky. And with this love inside, I'm going to walk a peaceful path. How many times do you let yourself get inspired? You know you've walked a peaceful path Yes, you can walk alone And walk a peaceful path Peaceful path Peaceful path